Hello friends, you're welcome back to my channel and my name is The Dreams of the Dreams TV. Thank you so much for stopping by and you're welcome. And right now I am in Nyungo and it is in Pram Pram. And Pram Pram is a part of the greater Accra region, okay? So right now we are at the African ancestral world, okay? So in here we're going to learn history, we're going to see pictures of great heroes and heroines of and in africa so we're going to learn a lot of things about them some you and i have never heard of some we've heard of so we're going to learn all of that most importantly we're going to get to interview the brains behind this beautiful edifice i mean it's it's a beautiful sight so if this is something you'd like to see i would want for you to come along with me and enjoy okay all right um friends you're welcome back and we're right here beside the brains of these beautiful edifices like i said so please sir can we meet you my name is jerry johnson i'm from los angeles california uh, i've been in ghana about 18 years i'm a garveyite which means that we're, we're people who feel like the african continent can be rebuilt to a point of power and sovereignty so we can lend support not only to ourselves but to Africans in the diaspora. I built the ancestral wall uh, mainly not really as a tourist um, type of attraction or anything. In fact, I never even had that in mind. What was really happening is that I started off going to Lagon and some of the other places back in 2004, 5, 6 talking about our African history. I'm kind of an amateur historian, but I realized that at that age, you know, the main thing on uh, uh, 18, 19, 20 year olds mind is not African history as much as it is, you know, what they're going to do after graduation <laughs> and are they going to travel and all of that. Yeah. So I realized that I should start going to the younger students and uh. start talking to them because they're a little more open to, you know, new possibilities. And so that's what I did. So I've spent a lot of time in schools, local schools, talking to the, you know, the young children. And, uh, but it's logistically, it's a little bit difficult because there's so many schools, you know, in Africa. So then I got the idea that since I, I've been living out here for a long time, I decided to take one of the walls on my property, plaster it, and then paint pictures of black historical figures and then bring the children here on uh, excursions or field trips. And then that way it's a lot easier for on me and then wait for them because they can come on an excursion with their bus and they're mm -hmm. excited and they're attentive and that kind of thing. So I've been doing that since about 2017. Okay. And uh, it's okay. been very, very uh, fruitful. And it's free to the public. Uh, and it always will be, you so know. So why Ghana? Ghana is a smaller country. English speaking, uh, I first was in Senegal and these other places, uh, but if you bring in friends and family and all, it's mm -hmm. easier to bring them to Ghana or Nigeria or Gambia. Mm -hmm. So Ghana was kind of a choice that way. It's more of a practical thing. So I'd like to know, what do you hope to achieve with this, with this project? Well, the idea, once again, is to uh, give our children more insight. You see, the, the part I forgot to mention is if you go into the schools, and it's the same in Nigeria, because I checked it out, and know people who have also checked it out. You know, there's so much of the education is about uh, European history, European orientation, yes, yes. European heroes and all of that, yes. and you don't even learn really your own history of black mm -hmm. people on the continent and the diaspora. So if you don't know, uh, you know, who you are, then you don't know what you can do. You know, if you don't know what you've done, you don't know what you can do. And so this is why they give you so much European history and soon you'll be getting a lot of Asian history, I'm sure, as their star rises because they want you to internalize their greatness for what mm. they did in the past and so you'll always be looking to them and feeling at some level inferior to them because of all of what they've done <laughs> and they've told you you've done nothing. So once you understand what you've also done and what your people have done, then you can aspire to, uh, you know, walk in the footsteps of your ancestors, you know, and build and, and organize nations and resist where necessary and, and see the future as something that is viable for black people. So you said you've been here for 18 years. 
right? In Ghana. In Ghana, right? Yeah. So um, to those people who are thinking, those in the diaspora are thinking, oh, should I come back home? Oh, is it worth it? What do you tell them? Well, the first thing I tell them is, um, you know, there's nothing like being a black man in a black country. I mean, you know, that's just, I mean, uh, you have a certain peace of mind and a certain um, just feeling that you don't have, say, if you're in America. Uh, in America, you, the people there don't really know the pressure they're under as black African people until they leave. But when you're in there, you know, it's just so normal that, you know, they're going to do this to you. You're not going to get that promotion or that break or that loan. And you just kind of, it's normalized. And so you just factor that into your living. Mm. But it's a weight that you carry, you know? And it's, um, it's unfortunate. So I, but at the same time, you know, I don't advise people just jump up and rush to Ghana or rush to Nigeria because it costs money to live here. You have to have some kind of plan, yes, especially yes. financially, how you're gonna make your way. Now, you, you don't have to have as much money as you'd have to live in a place like Los Angeles. But you still have to have money. <laughs> at, the end know, of the day. <laughs> at the end of the day, however you put that financial mm -hmm. plan together, whether and then of course tailor your suit to your size, as they say, which you know don't try to live too extravagantly, <laughs> mm -hmm. and try to you know figure out how you can live and what you can do. But I still would tell everyone if they nothing else, travel to Africa, see it for yourself. Don't stay away from Africa because you have these crazy ideas of what Africa mm -hmm. is. But I encourage everybody to at least make a trip, see for yourself. So back to the wall, mm -hmm. how long did it take you to build this? You mean the, the, the drawings? Wall. Yeah, the drawings. Well, the wall was already here because it's oh, the okay. wall of the property. Mm -hmm. It just had to plaster it, which you know only took no time, a month or something. But it took about, I'd say six to eight months to They were working in parallel. Mm -hmm. That's why you see different styles, you know, because you have different artists. Yeah. And there's 90, I think 90 or 92, I always forget to count them, uh, portraits. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's time for us to see the pictures. Oh, no and problem. Learn. Okay. okay. We're starting okay. off here with a Poka Kanyani. Poka Kanyani was a Fra Fra woman from the north of Ghana. What she is known for is having used this pestle that you see in her hand to actually fight off and, and kill some slavers who were coming into the region, you know, uh, to acquire slaves mm. in the area called Bukere, which is up in Bogotenga, modern Bogotenga. So she's known as uh, the woman who fended them off with her pestle. Uh, here, we, what we try to do is let the students understand about the bl black Africanness of ancient Egypt, or which we called ancient Kemet. So this is Queen T, or some call it Queen Tai, from the 18th dynasty, the wife of Amenhotep III, a very, very prominent figure in, in terms of her influence, in terms of her beauty, in terms of her uh, um, impact on that 18th dynasty. Now, of course, in the center, we have our man Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Garvey is our kind of center. We think about Garvey because he had the Universal Negro Improvement Association, largest black organization in the history of the world that we know of. Kwame Nkrumah, you see we're doing some painting repairs, but uh, this is important because he talks about having read Hegel and Marx and all of the so-called big brain Europeans, but the, the thinker who had the biggest impact on him was the Honorable Marcus Garvey, uh, that we talked. Uh, we're here at a place called Nuningo, the founder of Nuningo was uh, Jonas Kabu, and the first chief to join him was uh, Te Jangma the first. Ya Santawa, most Ghanaians know, Queen Mother Vajisu, of course known for her struggles against the British. Mamatan or Amazon warriors from Benin, the homie is Benin. Uh, these are the women who uh, fought with uh, Behanzen and the rest against the French during the colonial times. Stephen Biko, the thinker, writer, student organizer, uh, who basically fought and thought against the apartheid system. Because of the strength of his ideas, he was, of course, killed by the uh, apartheid government. 
Mary Makeba, uh, Mama Africa. Of course, uh, she was also a victim of the apartheid regime, was kicked out of her country or blocked from coming back for some three decades. And of course, one of the great songstresses. Ephraim Mamu, if you're from Peki, uh, Ewe Man. I was really impressed by him because what he really tried to do is keep things African and the Ghana National Anthem, and he's a composer and a... Nanny of Jamaica, born in Ghana, went as a child to Jamaica as a slave during the slave days. It became so powerful, so strong that she commanded her own. The British finally had to concede a part of the island to her. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, a lot of the children don't realize that even in my lifetime, uh, voting was almost impossible for black people in the U.S. This woman was you know, fighting for the right to vote for blacks in the U.S. In ancient Kemet, this is the world's first known multiple genius, Imhotep. He was a scribe, he was an astronomer, he was the world's first known medical doctor. Samuel Maharero in Namibia. This is another story that's not really told about how the Germans in Namibia committed a genocide against the Herero people and the Nama people there uh, back during this time frame. Maharero, being their leader, was trying to mitigate as well as possible you know, that damage being done to his people. Zabeth of Haiti. Uh, this girl started at nine years old on the French plantations in Haiti started running away. She ran away. They would catch her. They would beat her. She'd run away. They would catch her. They would torture her, brand her face, do everything. She'd keep running away. So at the end, you know, she died of an injury that had to do with one of her escapes. But uh, I have her here so the children kind of have an understanding. It started at nine years old. You got this indomitable spirit that just says, no matter what you do to me, I will not be a slave. Felix Mumi, I have him here because he was an up-and-coming uh, sharp politician in, in Cameroon, but he made the mistake of going to Geneva to negotiate, you know, with the whites in good faith. You know how they do that, thinking that's a... Well, of course, it uh, uh, didn't work out. They poisoned him with thallium at dinner. Uh, Nahanda, she was a spiritual leader or a spirit woman uh, there in Zimbabwe during their Chimaranga, which is their war resistance against the British. And so when they finally did catch her, uh, they hung her. Of course, Martin Luther King Jr., and the reason that really they were killing him is not because of his civil rights, but when he started getting into international affairs and advocating against the Vietnam War and America's imperialism around the world. Uh, the great Muhammad Ali, U.S., the greatest boxer of all time, at least in my opinion. <laughs> but he's really here because of his uh, resistance to you know, the American government wanted him to join the military, possibly go to Vietnam and war and all of that. And he says, you know, these people you want me to go kill have never done anything to me here. The only people who have been oppressing me here is you. So they took his title away from him and took it, you know, right in the peak of his career. Lachor Drop in Senegal, another one of the uh, kings, king of Kaior, which is a big territory in today's Senegal. Those days the French wanted to run their railroad through there and, and do other things, and he said, not through my place. So he fought the French, died in battle. Mkwavanika, uh, another one struggling against the Germans. In his case, uh, he was of the Hehe group in, in Tanzania. When the Germans finally did get him, they, they cut his head off. Ida B. Wells, everybody thinks it looks like Michael Jackson. She was an anti-lynching crusader. And so what I do sometimes, I show the children the pictures because what the European or the American used to do is lynch our people, hang them, and have parties around it, picnics. 
And then they send all of these pictures around. So, and, hey, you know, it's like Facebook today, right? It's like, hey, look where we were Saturday, you know, this. Uh, the great fella Kuti, which we know is uh, a resistance musician. And no matter what they did to fella, if you do something to fella, be careful. He'll come back with a strong, even worse song, even worse than the last one. Uh, the great Zumbi of Brazil. And the Portuguese had their slaves in Brazil. That's why they have so many Africans still there. When the Africans escape to plantations, they go into the mountains in their own places, kind of like Nanny and those. They're maroons. And uh, they have what they call quilombos, which are these mini nations, you know, in mountainous places where they can, you know, fight against the, uh, the Portuguese if they try to come. So he set up one called uh, Palmares, which was basically the biggest and the strongest of them. They lasted about a hundred years. Joma, he's the only one on the wall who still alive as far as I know, but when we were painting him, I actually thought he was an ancestor. And then we went on YouTube and he was dancing. So, we had, <laughs> so, so he's got his own, he's got his own space, place in the sun. So take his time, but he's got his spot. But anyway, he was leader against, you know, they had to fight the South Africans and South Africans had colonized Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia. So. Uh, Garrett Morgan, yes, he's the one who invented the traffic lights, you know, traffic signals. He also invented the gas mask, you know, that the, uh, the firemen wear to breathe in the smoke and all of that, and some other inventions. The great Winnie Mandela. Even if some of the other folks don't give her the proper recognition, we do. Because we know she had to struggle a long time against terrible odds. And at the end, I'm not sure she was given her due, but we're giving it to her here. Yes. So how long did it take you to learn all of this? Well, it really didn't take me long because most of these people I know, you know, because I, you know, I, since I chose them, they're pe people that I'd already been familiar with. So.